Diamondstein, welcome to Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography. Today we'll be talking to Joel Meyerowitz. Joel Meyerowitz has been photographing since the early 60s when he took to the streets. He is one of the photographers who has made the transition from seeing in terms of black and white to recreating a world defined by color. A leading figure in the new color movement of modern art photography, he is widely admired for his masterful handling of it and his exploration of the effects of light and shadow. A very warm welcome to you, Joe Meyerowitz. Thank you, Bob. You were working as an art director at a small advertising agency when you decided to try photography. How did that decision come about? It came about like uh, photographs themselves, instantaneously. I had been assigned to travel downtown with a photographer named Robert Frank, and observe his, uh, his shooting for an afternoon. And I was astonished by it. I thought to myself I had never seen anything like that before. And when I returned to the agency in the afternoon, I resigned. I felt that there was uh, something else out there for me, rather than sitting in an office and uh, making thumbnail sketches of products and advertisements. Did you know anything about taking photos? Photography was, uh, on the one hand, a mystery to me. On the other hand, um, a commercial enterprise. I had seen the work of Richard Avedon and Irving Penn and Hero and Magnum life photographers, but I had never seen any serious work. And I, I thought about Matthew Brady as one person. I didn't realize he was uh, a dozen uh, people working. And uh, it didn't occur to me that that serious photography existed. I just knew that I had to go out in the street with a camera and photograph. Well, how did you learn about the technical things? Well, that's something you do by doing it. I, I wasn't smart enough to ask uh, about a school. I'm, I'm not even sure schools existed at that point. And I, uh, I borrowed a camera from a friend and then I purchased a, a single lens reflex camera and I made photographs. And at night I would look at them. I shot in color right at the beginning because I I couldn't print black and white, and color seemed to me to, to be the most natural thing to turn to. In the evenings, I would look at the slides, and if they were too bright, I would know to make them darker the next time. And if they were too dark, I'd make them lighter. It's a very pragmatic, simple-minded approach to making photographs. Well, what made you take to the streets as your basic environment? It seemed natural to me to go right to the street. That was the stream. That's where the fish were. That's where I wanted to be. And Walking the streets provided me with all kinds of opportunities uh, that are about chance and time and speed. And I, I didn't see photography as something that I should manipulate in any way, that I should arrange like a portrait or a still life or anything studio bound. I felt that it was about instantaneity. The and camera, memory, you've said, too. And memory. Well, you have to remember everything that you do so that you know to build on that the next time you work. When I, when I photograph, uh, I have a machine that chips away at time, at a thousandth of a second or 250th of a second. And I learn to make gestures in that small sliver of time, somehow to thrust myself into a crowd or into a situation. And that's what I saw Robert Frank doing that first afternoon. I think that's what moved me more than anything else was the fact that he was in motion while he was making still photographs. And it seemed to me to be some kind of irony there that you could flow and, and dance and keep alive and at the same time 
chip away at things and just cut them off. And I like that. I like the physicality of that. You've described your early influences while growing up in the Bronx as low class but fun. There must have been something very special about that environment that influenced you and your two younger brothers. Well, I think that the, the uh, throbbing energy of the tenement and the street uh, pervades your life. I mean, there's always a drama outside your door, your window. It's the neighbors down the hall uh, enacting their uh, Molly Goldberg or, or <laughs> whatever family situation goes on. And right outside your window is the same thing. There are lovers in the street and quarrels and fights and car accidents and peddlers going by. It was a, a very uh, full environment. I mean, there's a casualness about photography now. People just go like that. And there's a picture. It isn't so much based on framing or rules of composition, anything academic or classical. It's about what the content is. It almost doesn't matter if it's framed nicely. If the content is strong and you feel something from the photograph, you've got a photograph. Your earlier work is part of that modern tradition that is referred to as street photography. I wonder if you'd take a moment and explain to us what that means. Street photography. It means to me being out on the street using your wits and your, um, your sense of place, your sense of yourself in that place, your willingness to deal with chaos and uh, arbitrariness. Things come at you and you have to um, work with them. You have to be responsive and full of feeling and you have to pay attention. It's a kind of uh, reveling in the chaos of the street that I think is what underlies the, uh, the idea of street photography. There are several central figures to that movement. To the works of which ones do you most respond? Well, I, th I think that Gary Winogrand is the reigning uh, duke of street photography. He's got the most playful mentality. He's alive to the possibilities of the street. He's uh, careless in the most wonderful way. And I think what's in his mind is in his photographs. Well, you have a particular reason to assi for assigning that uh, regal role to him. I guess it would be fair to say that he is one of your earlier mentors. Can you tell us about that? When I first went out on the street and I wandered around Fifth Avenue, I would bump into this curly-headed guy with a camera here and there. And occasionally we uh, would see each other working and we would join forces in some way. I would accompany him on his rounds and he would come with me for whatever I was doing. And I began to see what his appetite was about. I think that's what I learned from Gary, that you could trust the street to provide, that there was lots out there that life was uh, a thrill. And he, being 10 years older than me and having had a lot of experience on the street and doing magazine work and the like, <clears throat> he sort of showed me that that's what was possible. I think that's my, my debt to Gary more than anything else. Do you do any studio work at all? And if not, why not? I'm, I'm not at home in the studio. I don't know what to make of no seam. You know, it's it's more thrilling for me to be out in the street on location on the edge of the Grand Canyon or in Curacao or Paris. About three or four years ago, you were best known for your street photography and then you abandoned your handheld 35 millimeter camera. And as you just mentioned, you've changed to an old fashioned large format stand camera that, we, that was used by 19th century landscape photographers. That is quite a departure. Was there any set of circumstances that forced you or caused you to take that kind of risk? Yes, there are qualities within the medium that force you to confront your own behavior. I mean, at every inch along the way, I, I think you do that. You judge your own work. You, you sort of see where you're going and where you're coming from. And certain questions are raised by that. And, and one of them for me was quality in 
in the color print, in the image itself. I mean, photography is a thing of prints. You hold it in your hand, you get absorbed in it. It draws you in. You have to have this thing to hold. I still photograph with a small camera, almost daily, but I've learned to use two different instruments, to play two different kinds of music, to experience two different feelings about time. One is about duration, and the other is about instantaneity. But let me go back for a moment. I had always been um, strongly in favor of color photography. I think it's a half step closer to the way we feel and see reality. But I had to work in black and white because you couldn't print color with a kind of um, ease and, and command that you could print black and white. And so it was more effective to do black and white photography. At a point in the 70s when color technology made one more turn in the revolution in photography, I understood that now was the moment to throw all the risk in that area. You know, technology has always changed photography. Why don't you describe the equipment that you use now and some of the things that prompted the shift? What particular issues arose? Well, it was a big step to cut off uh, black and white work and commit myself to color. You're really changing the nature of your response. You know, it's, uh, it's a very different game out there. Black and white has a more, f more form in it. Somehow, pictures look like there's a compressed formal structure running through them that events are tied to. In color, there's more of a languid um, flow from one thing to the other. And learning how to make that switch is a, is a departure, was a departure for me. The issue that I was most interested in was a, the, the description of things in a photograph. And I felt at some point that black and white 35 millimeter imagery degraded in some way. When you made a print larger than 11 by 14, it began to turn into grain and gristle in some strange way. And I wanted something more articulate than that. And color has that characteristic. It's very full. It has a long, elegant tonal range. And I'm not a salon printer or a salon photographer, but I'm interested in telling as clearly as I can what it is I see and feel. And color seems to do that. So I made some investigations into color printing, 35 millimeter negative and 35 millimeter slides and the like. I had no idea what I was in search of. That's not how I think about making photographs. I go to a place to be in the place. When I'm there, I try and make photographs about how I feel about being there. Somehow, that changed the nature of my game. How do you contrast your old style with your new style? Well, let's see. One is about physical activity and gesture and spontaneity and thrust and, you know, just like that. It's fast. You have no time, expanded time, to examine your feelings. With an 8x10 view camera, you have time. There is this idea of duration. Things sit there waiting for you. Today's audience for photography is art-oriented. As a result, they are often suspicious of work that is beautiful. Have you ever experienced the bias against pretty pictures? Yes, I've, I've observed that some critics feel that uh, if you take a picture of what looks like a pretty place or a beautiful place, that you've only done half a job. And I, I don't think that my work looks like that, frankly. If you go to the very places that I stood in, it's unlikely that anybody else would want to make that photograph. It's an empty bay strewn with seaweed and some bottles, and boats turned on this side, or it's a, a casual and dumpy little bungalow, or a fence and some chairs. Nothing to speak of, really. What I think confuses some people is that when you see it in its great clarity and stillness, it glows in some way. It becomes beautiful. And it's so convincingly beautiful that they say, oh, that place is beautiful. Not necessarily so. But color has always been the unwanted guest of photography, the thing that was best left to amateurs. And what I really wonder 
if you would comment on if color photography has finally shed that kind of status, actually inferior status that was assigned to it by partisans of formalist black and white photography. I think it may be the other way around and that, that the partisans have shed their prejudices, that there's been enough color imagery coming out now. There's a whole young generation of photographers that pick up color right away because now there's a choice. And what happens is people begin to see that you can make a color picture as interesting as a black and white picture. It doesn't have to be about that red coat over there or that you know, blue object sitting on something else. It, it can be about your ideas, that it's as full of ideas and questions and imagery as black and white. And so on its terms, it's become convincing. You have several unusual ideas during the course of your career. More than a decade ago, you made a, an, unorthodox, an unorthodox comment on what could literally be described as the passing scene. And what I am referring to is the photographs that you made through the window of a car traveling at 50 miles an hour on a 20,000-mile tour that you took through the British Isles and Europe and Morocco and Greece. What were the circumstances of that? Was it an assignment? Were there pre precise instructions? How did that all come about? No, it was uh, a trip, something I earned and I gave to myself. And part of traveling is sitting in a car every day and going from place to place. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen this. I know it's happened in Most of my people. photographs come out that way. Oh, looking that way or may, <laughs> for looking those reasons. That way. But I mean, how many times have you been sitting next to someone and say, oh, did you see that? And when someone turns around, they say, what? Where he said, it was wonderful. And it's nothing more than a figure walking across the landscape, or it's a horse uh, kneeling down, or some ordinary, unnecessary object, or, or unnecessary event, I should say. And what I think happened to me was that I recognized them as significant through the means of the camera that you could just reach as you go by. And the camera, with one thousandth of a second, will snare that and hold it fixed in any way that you reached for it. Purely photographic instinct. You met Cartier-Bresson at an early point in your own career under rather unusual circumstances. I wonder if you would recall them for us. Well, it was one of those uh, thrilling moments of childhood in that way. I was out on a, on a uh, St. Patrick's Day parade photographing with Tony Ray Jones and another photographer. And there was a man in the crowd, darting and twisting and turning and pirouetting and leaping. And, and we were astonished by this, this fantasy in front of us. And we assumed that it could only be Cartier-Bresson. We had been photographing about a year, the three of us, and had only recently seen his book. And we just deduced that those pictures were made by someone who pirouetted that way. And I went over and said to him, uh, Excuse me, sir, are you uh, Cartier-Bresson? And he said, no, no, are you the police? <laughs> and I, I said, no, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm just a, f a photographer. And I, he said, yes, I'm Cartier-Bresson. You, you meet me here afterwards and I'll take you for coffee. And it was astonishing. We stood back a few paces and we watched him and he was a, a thrilling, balletic figure moving in and out of the crowd thrusting himself, pulling back, turning away. He was so full of, of uh, kind of a mime quality that we learned instantaneously that it's possible to efface yourself in the crowd, that you could just turn over your shoulder like a bullfighter doing a, a paso doble, and you're... Well, I guess he also learned to use that camera as a weapon. You learned that well, then, yes, too. yes, that's true. I, I saw him hurl it at somebody, a drunk, who came out of the crowd at, at Bresson, trying to reach for his camera, and Bresson threw it at him, and it was tied to his wrist, and it sort of snapped out and came back into his hand, and he turned and went Sounds away. Sounds like a yo-yo. <laughs> it was very much like that. And he just he pulled it in, like a third baseman, and it was effortless, and the other fellow, stunned, threw himself, fell back into the crowd, and Bresson was gone. Your work is meticulous and impeccably printed, but it appears to be directed toward a very different audience. For whom are they made? There's only one answer. I mean, they're made for me. There's no audience, as far as I'm concerned. 
I mean, I'm the audience. Are photographs for looking at things? Yes, real hard. I, mean, I, I study photographs. I read my own photographs for many what years. What do they teach you? They teach you, since they deal with the immediate past, or as long as you want to stretch your own past out. I mean, after you can make pictures in January and February and March and not look at them until the summertime, if you choose. They teach you about your own unraveling past or the immediacy of yesterday. And they show you what you looked at. You know? Because I assume that if you take a photograph, you've been responsive to something and that you looked hard at it. Hard for a thousandth of a second, hard for 10 minutes but hard nonetheless. And it's that quality of, of um, that bite that teaches you how up you were for that thing and where you stand relative to it. Since 1965, one of the most photographed objects in this country is Eero Saarinen's 630-foot arch in St. Louis. It's dominated that city, and for several months of your life, it dominated you. In the fall of 1977, you used that arch as your subject, in spite of the fact it had been photographed so often. Can you tell us how and by whom that commission came about, and why that subject matter, and why that place? What can I say? I've been to a lot of places, and they don't feel right. They don't invite you to come back and look around. But something about the the emptiness of the downtown area, the proximity of the river, the grace of the arch, all of it said, there's something here. And I was asked to come out and spend four weeks over a period of a year to do what I felt like doing, which was walking around and discovering myself in St. Louis and photographing what was interesting to me. And so that's what produced those pictures. They're basically curiosity, the curiosity of a stranger in a strange place. You've been called the very model of a Museum of Modern Art photographer, a product of that photo aesthetic that is promoted by that institution. I think that some people view the museum as uh, too powerful a place. And it's not. The museum is a library. It holds ideas. It has uh, changing bodies of work. It's um, very much the width and breadth of the real stream of art, photography or painting. And the man who stands in the position to see what's coming down that stream best, in this case is John Sharkovsky, is a real fisherman. He loves the sport and he stands in that river and he picks up whatever comes his way and he says, that's interesting, it's a little small. I'll put that back, it'll come by again next year. And I think his generosity and his appetite for the game brings us a wide range of photographs to look at and to think about. Among your street photographs, very few record specific events. However, there is one that depicts an accident in Paris. Mm -hmm. Is it surprising to you that that photo is probably among your best known works and perhaps you might describe the circumstances of that picture? Well, it's not surprising. That's the, uh, the height of the decisive moment aesthetic. Something happens. You happen to be in the right place at the right time with a tool. You make a picture because you know how to make pictures in situations like that. As soon as I've, I mean, uh, quite often when I've shown that photograph, people have screamed at me, why didn't you run over and help that man instead of taking a picture? And I usually answer, well, I don't speak French that well, I could, that I could assist that man, and all those other people were standing around, why didn't they help him? You, in a way, you're an opportunist, you know? You make pictures out of what's handed to you. And you once said, I can't photograph something I don't like. It's an enormous luxury. Is that accurate? Have you ever had to do that? No, I haven't had to do anything like that. I, what I mean by that, you know, in a more elaborated way is that I can't go and photograph um, Bedford Stuyvesant for pleasure. When I go to a place like Bed Stuy, I feel the need of the place. And I can't make aesthetic works out of someone else's uh, depredation. 
You've been in the thick of it and on the streets all of your life. In fact, you're especially partial, I suspect, to street photographers. You're currently working on an, on an historical survey of American street photography. What will that be about and to what era do you date its origins? I joined forces with a man named Colin Westerbeck, Jr., who writes on photography, and we began giving ourselves the pleasure of afternoons in archives and museums looking at photographs. No axe to grind, just to look and see what was there. And so what have the, you found? We found a very rich history of people who were crazy in the street, who had the right kind of temperament for street photographers, people who were willing to risk it all with the snap of a shutter. Your work frequently records the interplay of natural and artificial light at twilight. At what time of day do you work at your best? Well, I think because I have two different materials that I work with, I have two preferred hours. I love the sunny side of the street in the middle of the day. You can find me on Fifth Avenue any, any day, any glorious day. With the view camera, there's a tendency, because of the camera's qualities, to work later. The camera has, uh, the film, I should say, has a long way of looking into the twilight. Very tough. It records everything. It's, it draws out of that time all the information and makes it very palpable in some way. Do you plan to explore further your work in the American landscape and do you plan to continue in that direction and explore either the mountainous regions or the deserts? I love making photographs wherever I go. So I'm sure I'll be in the Southwest sometime and I'll make photographs there. But I, I can't say that there's a 40th parallel idea that I have, that I want to traverse the country and cover every inch of it along that line. I, I just take it as it as it comes. I did learn something about working in, in the West when I spent time in St. Louis, and that's that the, the subtle character of the light is enough to change things for you. Things feel differently out there. There's the dust in the air as opposed to the clarity in the air in New York City, or so maybe it's about being on the coast and being inland. You describe that when you look through this vintage camera, the images are all there, but they're upside down. How do you make that adjustment? You spend some time on your head for a while. <laughs> it's, at, at first, I help myself by taking a mirror in and making a reflex out of it, just like that Nikon you had before. I turned it right side up. And it makes things into a wonderful, mysterious surreality at first. People seem to walk on the ceiling and uh, Furniture floats. How and, do you compensate for that? And how do you get the same immediacy and urgency that you get it's, by looking at things really with the naked eye? It's a wonderful absorption in the, in the thing itself. You learn to give up content in context, which is what you do with a small camera. You're always looking outside and seeing it right side up. Now when you're in the dark of the cloth and the camera, you have a theater for yourself. And that theater is fascinating. And if things are upside down without gravity, you accept them and somehow make a picture out of that. Thank you, Jill Meyerowitz, for sharing your intelligent, disciplined, eloquent approach to your art, and thank you very much for sharing it with us. Thank you, audience, for coming to help. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography. Mm -hmm.